Welcome to our Tomata ROI update uh, for the 16th of March 2022. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Tazimir Tim King to introduce us to tonight's uh, proceedings. Tim, it's, it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks, Darren, uh, and welcome, and thanks to all those who have taken the time uh, to come along and attend um, this session this evening, um, and thanks to the representatives from Taumata Arawai for uh, making themselves available to come here and hopefully provide both some information and answer some questions um, over the next hour or so. Uh, from this year and over the next few years, community water supplies are going to become subject to greater scrutiny and are going to have to meet higher standards for both safety, uh, health and environmental stewardship. Uh, Taumata Arawai, the government's water services regulator, is charged with ensuring that drinking water supplies uh, meet the new requirements um, over a number of years, uh, and that applies to different supplies at different times, and I'm sure they will cover that in the course of their presentation. The creation of Taumata Arawai and the water services legislation uh, that was passed in 2021 were a direct result of the Havelock North drinking uh, water contamination uh, back in 2016 and subsequent governments have been working towards a new structure uh, since then, and that culminated in the passing of the water services legislation. While there'll be uh, obvious impacts on councils as a drinking water supplier to a large number of um, residents and ratepayers across our region, which are likely to have uh, cost implications for us and them, there's also in the future uh, significant or well, likely ramifications for many members of our rural communities who currently operate private water supplies. Um, the new rules applying to water supplies that supply more than one household. So, and this covers bores uh, and rainwater uh, collection as well. So there's a whole range of circumstances across our region and across the country uh, that are likely to fall into those categories. Um, it's there is uh, various estimations of how many that applies to, and I'm not sure whether anyone will want to venture a number, but it is uh, potentially many tens of thousands of situations which may well be captured over time. Uh, Tamara Arawa is currently seeking public feedback on several aspects of the regulations that apply in these circumstances. Uh, and um, certainly from a council's perspective, a couple of them that caught our eye and I, I um, kind of provided the impetus for this um, meeting tonight were around the acceptable solutions for both bore water supplies and rainwater supplies. I do want to make it really clear for those, uh, and this does appear to be some confusion, uh, between the three waters uh, legislation and conversation which is currently live across the country. This is not that. Uh, there is some potential future linkage but I think in terms of tonight's presentation, uh, the people who you are hearing from are not in a position to answer questions about three waters. Uh, and so the focus needs to be very fairly and squarely on the water services legislation, Taumata otherwise role, and the role and the impacts on those private water supplies. This evening's presenters from Taumata Arawai are Bill Bayfield, Jim Graham and Ray McMillan, and I'd like to thank them again uh, for making the time to come along this evening. I'll let them introduce themselves in due course. For the question and answer um, function on the Zoom, so it's the Q&A function that if you have any questions you need to put in there, uh, the chat function is not available, so please exercise the question and answer. Um, function on the Zoom. With a, number, a large number of people participating this evening, it may not be possible for everyone to get all their questions asked and answered during the course of the evening, but hopefully what you'll leave here with is uh, a greater understanding of the role of Tamara Arawai, the implications and the timeframes around the suggested rules and regulations, uh, and then take the opportunity to submit directly into the process whereby they can consider the feedback. So from our point of view as the Tasman District Council, we're just here to facilitate the opportunity to connect Taumata Arawai and our community. Uh, and hopefully people will leave with a greater understanding uh, and hopefully a willingness to make a direct submission into the process. So with that, I thank everyone for their attendance, um, taking the time to participate. And I'll hand over to Bill, Jim and Ray. Kia ora, Tim. Um, I'll just start with a, um, with a, <clears throat> a quick mihi and then, um, and then I'll just introduce kind of how the things will flow tonight. Uh, ko te wai ahau, ko ahau te wai, he whakatū rangatātou nō te wai. 
ko te ora te wai, ko te ora o te tangata. He taonga te wai metiaki, ko wai tātou, ko wai tātou, a tihei mauri ora. E ngā hau e whā o te mutu ngamehi o te rā ki a koutou. Uh, no mai ki te ko rero rero e a taumata aroai, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, thank you for uh, for inviting us to join you today. Uh, ko Ray McMillan tuku ingoa, uh, ki te mātua mana whakahaere waituri o Taumata Arawai. I'm the Head of Regulatory here at Taumata Arawai uh, and I report through to uh, Chief Executive Bill Bayfield. Um, I started um, the introduction there with a whakatauki which is um, quite special to Taumata Arawai and the, at the heart of the whakatauki uh, it asks us to reflect on the connection between healthy water and healthy people and that we all stand as reflections of that relationship, um, that we're, we look after the water, um, generally we're looking after the well-being of people. And that's really, uh, I guess, the kaupapa, the purpose of Taumata Arawa, and I think it's a kaupapa that most people can, can connect with. Um, drinking water, safe drinking water is important to everybody uh, at every stage of, uh, of life. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to um, split, uh, the, I guess, the things we'll talk about between uh, myself, uh, Bill and Jim. So Bill's going to talk to you about the journey of Taumata Arawai through that um, reform program early on um, and where we are now. I'm going to talk you through um, what it means depending on whether you're registered or unregistered and what those timelines look like for you in terms of uh, having to meet um, compliance or how the Water Services Act um, relates to you. And then Jim's going to talk you through what how the rules, standards and acceptable solutions work. What we're going to do is try and get through that as quickly as we can so that we allow a lot of time for, uh, for Partai for you to ask your questions. Um, now, the only other thing I wanted to do was to reflect on three other whakatauki which are really important to Taumata Arawa, and they reflect the kind of regulator that we want to be. The first one is Karanga Hianga Opi, and it really talks to us about um, being human, being real, being uh, welcoming, listening, and then responding. So it's about understanding. Uh, the next one, Whangaia Te Iwi. Um, and it's about sustaining the, the sector. There's a lot of work to do in three water reforms and in improving the delivery of uh, and the performance of our, of our drinking water sector, but our water services in New Zealand. And we want to do that by providing the guidance, support and encouragement where we need to. And the other one is kahoki ko mūri ngā whakaaro ki a anga whakamua te tituru. And that asks us to turn our minds to the past and, and then uh, determine a way forward. And when we look back uh, from the Havelock North incident and others like it, um, that helps us to keep focused on, on what's important. It helps us keep our focus really broad to learn from overseas, uh, to learn from others, and to learn from our mistakes, and then carefully think about how we go forward so we don't repeat those. Um, that's the way we want to be as a regulator, and we expect and ask uh, the sector to hold us accountable to acting in that way. That being said, I'm now going to hand over to um, Bill, who's going to talk you through uh, the journey so far for Tamata Arawa. Kia ora. Uh, thank you, Ray. Tēnā tātou katoa, ko wai ahau, ko Bill Bafield ahau, te tūmu whakarai o te mateo, te mata arawai. Um, I started off as the establishment CEO of te mata arawai not far off two years ago. I was previous to that the CEO of Environment Canterbury and, and prior to that the Bay of Plenty. Uh, and, but this has been uh, an incredible journey um, for me and the staff as we put together uh, Taumata Arawai at the request of the government um, and so I just thought I'd take you through some steps of that and, and show you how we got to where we got to and to also draw on some of Tim's points and just know who we're not i.e three waters reform but nevertheless we're strongly linked to them and so um, uh, we're interested in what they do uh, and how they're journeying. Um, I'm sure that every one of you knows that all tap all that comes out of a tap is not necessarily safe to drink. And, and New Zealand really learnt that through the Havelock North water contamination incident. You know, it's not often you, you literally poison 8,000 um, plus people. And uh, having been up to Havelock North and visited that community, I can tell you that that community believes that an awful lot more people than four died. Um, probably four died in the immediate incident, but a lot have suffered since. I think it's a lot like long COVID, isn't it? And the inquiry that was done then to take a look at our drinking water system was pretty full. Indeed, the chair of that inquiry was Dame Karen Putazi, and also on that uh, inquiry was um, uh, Anthony Wilson. Um, both of them are now on our board. Indeed, Dame Karen chairs our board, and so 
we've got that continuity coming through from Havelock North, it, it really does drive us. But that inquiry really showed up those systemic failures. What it said was nobody was actually doing their job very well uh, at Havelock North. And that, that was from the Ministry of Works right down to the contractor uh, working on the bore head. Um, and so uh, a lot of people were let down, a lot of people lost trust. And uh, I saw that never again healthy water for healthy people sign uh, when I went up to Hastings and it, it really resonated with me. Um, so if I move on, um, we're part of a system wide reform. And I think that that's important to recognize we are part of it. We're part of the three waters reform, but we're, the, we're what um, the Naya Mahuta describes as a first two PO. So the first two PO, first one was to set up a dedicated water services regulator. Uh, and, and the government agreed that that would be separate from Ministry of Health. So we're a crown entity. Uh, we stand um, independently. Uh, we've just had our first birthday um, and uh, COVID's made some of our delivery timetables a little mucked up, but um, we've got there. The second part of our regulatory reform or second PO is our Water Services Act. And, and that sets out our power and functions and indeed those powers and functions and duties of anybody operating under our legislation. And on that count, I think we're three and a half months old. Um, and that's been a pretty wild ride, um, I can tell you. We're also butting up against the third part of the reform, which is the service delivery reform, what you guys know as the three waters um, to provide access, access to more affordable and reliable water services. Um, they obviously stay in touch with us. We stay in touch with them. But we're actually an independent regulator already separated from DIA who's driving that service delivery reform. And we would be an independent regulator working with anybody in, who is a water supplier. And I think that needs to be recognized that we'll start off and we are now working with, with territorial local authorities and government departments. Uh, and we're working right now with small suppliers throughout the MOTU. I thought I'd just put this up because it, it's there's a little bit of misunderstanding and we cover through the water system, the three waters, we cover drinking water, we cover wastewater, and we cover stormwater. We don't actually begin work on wastewater and stormwater till November 2023. And, and there's a clear difference between the way we, we handle freshwater, drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater. So freshwater is, I've got there a regional council, but of course, Tasman District is a unitary council, so it's a regional council as well. It handles freshwater. Um, we handled the frontline regulation on, on drinking water. That was considered important enough that we've become the equivalent of the Ministry of Health, although operating under a very different, um, I, I guess, regime. On wastewater and stormwater, though, we recognize and will work with regional councils. They will remain the frontline regulator. Uh, we will be the oversight regulator. Um, big differences there, and it's the whole picture. Can I go to the next slide? Water Services Act. So we became the new regulator on the 15th of November. <clears throat> Most of the Water Services um, Act came in effect on 20, at 15th of November. But as I said, the provisions to stormwater and wastewater are delayed. The new arrangement represents a, a complete reform of, of the status quo. And they're designed particularly with consumers in mind to give consumers that confidence that what they're drinking is safe. And um, that's certainly what I think New Zealand learned out of Havelock North, the trust that most people place uh, in an organisation that provides them drinking water out of a tap was kind of burned through that event. And so much of our act is aimed at giving consumers back confidence. And a requirement of the act is to give effect to Tamano to Wai. There are two big shifts in our legislation and Tamano to Wai is absolutely one of them. But the first one is actually that Anybody who takes the job on of supplying someone else of water takes on a duty of care, much like health and safety legislation, same concepts. So if you take it on, you're taking on the delivery to a human being or a family of something pretty akin to a human right. That is the right to fresh drinking water. And so that's really huge, a huge change. The second big change is that we are the first crown entity to be required to give effect to the principles of Te Mano Te Wai, we won't be the last. They're being built in right now to the RMA and to a number of RMA review and a number of other different forms of legislation. But it is interesting, those principles bring a very different way of looking, uh, I guess, at a task. And that applies to not only all our functions and duties, it also applies to all of those with duties under our act. So it applies or those principles apply 
to all drinking water suppliers who operate under the Act and will in turn apply to all wastewater operators and stormwater operators. Thank you. Tamana, um, Tamata Arawai, uh, you can, I'm sure, hear from the way we're set up, the way we're, we're working. We've put a lot of effort into making sure that, that we, as the first crown entity that has a give effect to Tamana Arawai, can help other people understand what that is, what that means, uh, and how to literally make it work. Um, but it is about restoring and preserving the health, well being, and the balance between water people and the environment. Uh, and really, those three principles say, First comes the river, the intrinsic value of water. Second comes the health of the people. And only if those two first principles are satisfied comes the third uh, principle, which is to give, uh, I guess, room for consumption, for provision, uh, for actually using water for the good of people and the good of whatever water body you're dealing with. It's a big task here. Um, and being at the cutting edge of something like this is a little bit challenging, a little bit exciting. So that's it from us. What I'll handle, hand over to now is Ray to take you through the consultation that we've got on the go at the moment. Yeah, to Bill. Um, so yeah, what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk to a little bit about um, who the Water Services Act applies to and who it doesn't apply to. And then I'll step through uh, two roadmaps and then uh, finish off with a, with, um, a short corridor on, um, on the public consultation that we've currently uh, got underway and how you can access those documents. So um, <clears throat> who does the Water Services Act regulate? Well, if you supply water to a household other than your own, you are a water supplier. That goes really, really deep. So um, Bill normally uses this example. If Uncle Fred came back from the war, built a batch, um, and then you know some of his mates built some batches around, and then um, Fred started supplying them with water, they're a water supplier. Um, and, and that's quite a different... Um, picture than perhaps what you think about when you think about large council supplies. So the breadth and the scope of the Water Services Act is, is quite enormous. And you're probably there thinking, well, um, I, I'm caught, particularly if you're in the rural space, um, that, that you, you could well end up being a, a drinking water supplier. And if I reflect on Tim's comments in terms of the tens of thousands potential drinking water regular uh, drinking water suppliers yeah that's the that's the issue we're grappling with now at the moment because there's a large portion of this now regulated community that has never been regulated before that means no one really knows anything about them and that's our job is to get to understand you and i'll talk to you a little bit about how we um, see ourselves being able to do that over the coming years it's a pretty modern piece of legislation. It gives us all sorts of tools um, to apply in different kinds of ways. So what it isn't is a one size fits all approach to drinking water. It means we can tailor it, but in order to tailor and get the right so regulatory solutions, we need to understand. So, you know, we need to engage, we need to listen, and then we need to think very carefully about how we use all of these different tools we have in the, in the legislation to make sure they fit and work because what we want to do is we want to allow people to continue to supply drinking water, um, noting that um, you know there has been a change, but we want to make it um, as simple and as easy for people to comply um, so they can continue to supply drinking water, understanding that they have now have a duty of care to supply safe drinking water. If you supply water to your own home and that's all you do, you're not caught. So you're outside of Taumata Arawai's uh, regulatory um, framework, but you are caught by you know, local councils um, through their, their building um, controlling authority. Um, so that's, that's where that fits. So you're not unregulated, you're just not in Taumata Arawai's space. And if you're a business that only uses water for processing, i.e. you don't supply it to workers or you don't supply anybody outside um, that manufacturing process, you are not caught by the Water Services Act either. You're caught by uh, food safety, um, and if it's um, in the primary sector and um, subject to any, any other legislation that MPI administers, you'll be caught by, uh, by that regulatory system. You won't be caught by the Water Services Act. However, if you're doing both, using it for processing and you're providing it to, um, to employees, staff or other people for the purposes of drinking, then you are a drinking water, uh, a drinking water provider. Um, okay, if we move on to the, to the roadmaps, 
we've got, got two roadmaps here. The first one is for registered water suppliers. And when we say registered, this means if you were previously registered with the Ministry of Health, then you're already on the register. So what the legislation does is it carries all those registrations across to Taumata Arawai. And if you're registered, then you're registered now. Um, if we haven't been in touch with you um, to get you to set up a user account on our system called Hinekorako, um, we will be um, because we're currently going through that process of um, now that we've got your registered details, reaching out to you to set up your user account so then you can start to, I guess, interact with Taumata Arawai and get an understanding of what's required. So the, the transfer of registrations happened. Uh, from the 15th of November, we've got the 17th there. We were a couple of days late, but we had... Um, we had a need to get the laboratories, all the accredited laboratories in first, and that's what we did. So we gave everyone uh, who was registered a couple of extra days um, before we started harassing them. Um, from January um, to where we are now, we're just reaching out to the various uh, suppliers. So we've got all of the all of the council supplies now set up in Hinekoraku, and now we've got about 1,200 registered suppliers um, who are non-council owned, non-government owned supplies um, that we're now reaching out to getting them to set up their user accounts and to confirm their supplies. What we want to be able to do from the 1st of July is to bring in the new, essentially the first rocks for the, or the first um, pieces of, um, uh, of the regulatory framework. And those are the, the revised drinking water standards, um, new, new compliance rules, um, some acceptable solutions, and then um, some reporting requirements around um, environmental performance for drinking water networks. And then what we what you'll also need to do is by the 15th of November have submitted a, a drinking water safety plan to Taumata Arawai. So if you're registered, you've got um, between now and the, 7th, uh, the 15th of November um, to understand the rules, um, get, get set up on any Korako and then provide us with a drinking water safety plan. One of the key things um, about um, the small registered supplies is you provide us with a really valuable opportunity to get to know what um, sort of the mixture, the fit and feel um, for the different types of supplies in that small supply sector. And that means we can learn a lot and then think about what that means for um, the potential 75 odd thousand um, water supplies that we then need to understand and uh, think about how we how we manage those as a regulator. So we'll be reaching out to you um, very much in the um, with the intention of understanding, uh, making sure that you've got the information that you need so that we can think about what the task looks like for us over the next uh, next few years as we start to um, continue to um, bring new suppliers in. The next roadmap is for unregistered water supplies and life's quite different for you. If you weren't previously registered with um, the Ministry of Health, um, then you've got a much longer time frame um, before you need to register and before you need to set, uh, send us your uh, drinking water safety plan. So you've got to, the, um, to the November 2025 it is to, um, to register. So you've got four years to register with Taumata Arawa. Um, and then a further three years from, from that date to submit your drinking water safety plan. So what that means is that gives Tomata Arawai and yourselves four years to really get to know each other and for us to think about actually how do we, uh, how do we test out some of these ideas that we're thinking um, and making sure they fit, but also um, for us to engage, understand and think about how we take that information to um, come up with regulatory, regulatory solutions that are going to work for you. So it's a really important four-year period, um, and um, also means there's a lot of there's a lot of shifting because we know the three water reforms are, are happening, um, and as they shift, we'll understand a little bit more about what the lands, la uh, landscape starting to look like for us and respond to that. So it's a really important four years. Um, if we come and um, reach out to you, it's because we're doing that because we know that um, you're either quite unique or there's an opportunity for us to learn from you. So if you do see Tomata Arawai reaching out to you, that's the reason we'll be doing that. Um, you still have an obligation to provide safe drinking water. Every water supplier from the 15th of November under the Water Services Act had an obligation to provide safe drinking water. But if you're unregistered, you don't need to do, um, you don't need to uh, notify Taumata Arawai, you don't need to register for four years, and then you don't need to have your drinking water safety plan in place until November 2028. And the only other thing I want to mention uh, tonight is just to talk you through consultation. And we've currently got consultation underway. It closes on the 28th of March. So we kicked it off on the 17th of January. Uh, we did 10 weeks. Um, we're about week number eight now, and it'll close at the end of this month. 
We're currently um, consulting on a revised set of drinking water standards, um, which incorporate uh, a lot more material, and Jim will probably talk to that in a bit more detail. Drinking water quality assurance rules. So we've split the standards and the rules um, are currently in one volume, um, separated those. Uh, aesthetic values, so what your water looks and smells like, tastes like. And then we've created three acceptable solutions. And we're really keen to get feedback on these acceptable solutions because these are one of the new tools that we have under the Water Services Act um, to help us uh, find ways that make it easy for people to take a, a ready-made um, solution, implement that and meet their obligations as a drinking water uh, provider or supplier. And the only other thing that's very different that you wouldn't have seen before is the Drinking Water Network environmental performance measures because the Water Services Act is not just about the treatment of water. We're starting to look at how we look after source water from that aspect of Timana or Te Wai and making sure that we're looking after the well-being of our, our waterways and our water bodies. Um, but we're also looking at what happens uh, when that water leaves the treatment plant. Does it get where it needs to go? Uh, and how effective are we in terms of managing that? So that's what that network environmental performance measures is all about, making sure we understand that the water we take gets where we need it to go. Uh, and I'm just going to hand over to Jim now. He's going to talk you through all of those uh, consultation documents and, and what they might mean for you. Kia ora, Jim. Nā mihi rei um, and kia ora tato. Uh, ko Jim Graham aho, and I'm the Principal Advisor at Drinking Water within Tomata Arawai. Um, and my backgrounds, <coughs> excuse me, my backgrounds, um, public health and water quality science and, and, and uh, water supply, water systems, water treatment. So, so I'm going to talk through rules, standards, acceptable solutions and, and what these things are. Um, and we'll start with the rules. So next slide. Um, sorry, we'll start, we'll start with looking at, at a bit of an overview of these things. So, so first up is the standards. And, and the thing you need, people need to realise is that water's never... What is never just hydrogen and oxygen molecules together? There's always something else in it. And, uh, you know, if it's groundwater, there might be a little bit of iron and a little bit of manganese. In some places, you get a little bit of arsenic or boron. And, and so what the standards do is they say, uh, what is the maximum allowed, amount of those contaminants that you're allowed to have in the water? And so standards are just about what we call maximum acceptable values for, for a range of things that you might find in water. We've reviewed these. They're based on the values set by the World Health Organization as they have been in the past. And so, so we largely follow the World Health Organization on the standards. As well as that, there's what we call acceptable values, and Ray mentioned this, and this is the properties that um, affect the taste and the, the um, odor and of, of water. And so we've uh, reviewed those as well. And again, they're largely based on what the World Health Organization uh, recommends. The other important document that we've uh, put together is what we call drinking water quality assurance rules. And this sets out the requirements that um, water suppliers need to follow to meet their duties under the Water Service Services Act to provide uh, safe drinking water. And, and so it's a, way that, um, it's a way that water suppliers can demonstrate that they're doing that. Um, and, and so uh, there's a pretty comprehensive set of rules and, and we've tried to we try to make the rules uh, um, proportionate to the to the size of water supply. So they've got different rules for different sizes and types of supply. Thanks, Liana. So if we look at small supplies, and this is this is supplies that supply water to uh, at the moment the the fifty to five hundred people is the thresholds that we're looking at. And so they, they set some minimum requirements. And the first is, is about filtration of water to remove particulate material. material. Um, and, and that's because uh, if you've got a lot of dirt in the water, your, your treatment processes generally won't work very well. Um, use UV disinfection to control microorganisms. We know that if water is contaminated with uh, microorganisms of a fecal origin, uh, um, and that we use the indicator E. coli to tell us that, uh, we know that that's likely to cause illness. So if you have a UV disinfection, you can, um, you can control those organisms. A chlorination uh, um, provides what we call a residual disinfectant, and that means water within a, within a, a reticulated system a uh, pipe network, uh, if it becomes contaminated in that network, then there's some chlorine there to control those microorganisms. And of course, monitoring and testing. But as I said before, there's different requirements for different supplies and, and for smaller supplies, and I guess that's the interest here, um, we, uh, 
we're trying to make those rules workable um, and um, not too difficult, um, but realistic, uh, and trying to balance the um, need to protect public health um, and, and cost and a few other things. So, so we will adjust these rules based on the feedback we get from consultation, which Ray has mentioned. Um, and it's really important that we hear from people so that we can understand how these rules will affect them um, and, and whether there's things we need to change. Thanks, Liana. So underneath the um, uh, quality assurance rules, we're looking at these things we call acceptable solutions. And so we're giving, uh, we're wanting to give water suppliers a couple of options here. And either they can follow these rules um, or they could follow an acceptable solution. And the, the idea of the acceptable solutions is uh, they say, rather than uh, following the rules and trying to figure out what you've got to do, uh, it's a bit of a plug and play solution. And the acceptable, acceptable solutions say, just do this. If you just do this, you'll be fine. Uh, and you follow the acceptable solution and, uh, and, it, and it gives you a treatment option um, that's uh, tried and true and proven way of going about things. And uh, you can just plug and play that approach. Um, we've developed three so far. Two of them uh, use endpoint treatment systems, in other words, treatment at the household rather than at a centralised treatment place, and we are seeking feedback uh, on all of those acceptable solutions. We may develop more acceptable solutions depending on what people ask us to do in the public consultation process. Um, and, and we're looking at the, the costs. I know that people have raised with us the cost of some of these things, and um, we're having a look at what those costs are. And uh, um, it's something that people people need to know and will want to know so that they can make a um, informed decision on, on, on what's the best approach to take with uh, their supply. But um, I think it's important people look at these acceptable solutions and see if they're workable for them. Uh, thanks, Liana. Um, so these are the three that we've produced so far. One's for roof water supplies. And, and again, I point out, this is not a domestic household. This is a, a, um, a water supply. It might be a sports club. Um, it might be a marae. Um, it, you know, it might be a hostel or something of that kind that's using roof water. And, and, um, and that's a solution that uses a, a, a very simple uh, treatment system, cartridge filters and UV. Springs and bores um, uh, is, is up to 500 people. Um, and, and again, a lot of small suppliers use springs and bore water. Um, at the moment, the springs and bore uh, acceptable solution is around a centralized treatment system. We've asked the question uh, in our consultation is, is whether that should be a solution for endpoint treatment, in other words, for cartridges and UV at, at each household. So we're really keen to hear back from people about um, uh, whether the approach we've proposed there is the right one or whether we should rethink that and maybe it should be an um, endpoint treatment. So we're keen to hear back what people say on that. And then rural agricultural water supplies, th these are supplies that um, these are supplies that provide stock water um, and, and uh, people, people might connect into those water supplies for a, for a drinking water supply. Um, and so, so again, what we're looking at here is, is a household treatment system of cartridge filters and UV. And I'm, I might say that many, many of um, these supplies already have those treatment systems uh, installed. So um, uh, it's, kind of a, it's kind of following um, a, a pattern of, of what people already do. One of the key things about the uh, acceptable solutions is if you adopt an acceptable solution, if you decide to go down this path, you're not required to prepare a water safety plan. Um, and so, uh, and simply because we believe that the acceptable solution is a solution that manages the risks. So, so the water safety plan is not, uh, not required. So those are um, the things that we're uh, seeking uh, um, public feedback on. And Liana, if you go to the next slide, Ray mentioned this. Um, oh, sorry, they've got one more here. Um, working with the unregistered community, and Ray kind of covered this. Um, so, so we've got estimates there could be 75,000 unregistered supplies. Um, and, and, you know, that's a lot. That's a lot of water supplies to be uh, um, engaging with. Um, but we're committed to the, the uh, concept here of safe, uh, reliable drink water supply. And, and, and what we need to do, and again, Ray talked about this, we need to work with rural communities um, with, with water supplies um, to so they understand the obligations and uh, they've got 
some practical technical advice on on how to how to do things um and and uh we need to engage so we can hear back from them and on on what we're trying to do as a as another um point the government's got a 30 million dollar support pilot uh for acceptable solutions well it's actually for upgrading our rural water supplies and it, and it's to upgrade these water supplies so that they'll meet the acceptable solutions and the department of internal affairs is is managing that um, so then last slide uh, thanks liana is, is just how you go about um, having your say about all of this. Uh, you can go to our website um, and uh, uh, there's um, a process there that you can follow. Um, and we ask specific questions about each of our documents and, and we're asking you to um, have a look at those and give us some feedback. Um, and we appreciate it and, and it'll be really helpful to us. Thanks very much. Okay, thank, thank you chaps, really appreciate that. That's. Um, uh, a really in-depth overview there. We, we do have a number of questions. We have um, more than a dozen questions. So um, I'll introduce myself. Sorry, I'm Darren Palmer. I'm from the Tasman District Council Communications team. And um, I've been vetting the, uh, collecting the questions as they've come in. So I'd like to put them to you guys. You can decide who's going to answer it or who's, who's best placed to answer it. So we'll start from the top. And you have covered many of these. Many of these questions came in before you covered them. But um, first up, does this apply to landowners who have springs on their property that supply other households, but at no cost? So this person supplies the other places, but they don't charge them for it. How does this fit into the into the current situation? Well, let's. Uh, um, I guess the, the nuance there is, is it just a case of providing access to source water? So everybody helps themselves to the to the source, to the spring or um, wherever the, the source of water is and they supply their own households or is the person who has the spring supplying other people with drinking water? So in the first situation where everybody's accessing that spring water um, on their own, no, they're not a drinking water supplier, they're just providing access to water. But if the landowner is taking uh, that water and then distributing it to other households, then yes, they would be a water supplier. Okay, thanks, Ray. Um, another question, which is, is quite an interesting one. Are you classed as a supplier if you have a well, but there are three or four other people with their own pumps pumping from that well to their properties? So how does that stack up? I think that's the that's the same same example, the first example in terms of people are accessing the source water themselves uh, and they're, they're the ones responsible for supplying the water to their homes. Yep, yep, thanks for that. All right. Um, a question uh, Do I understand correctly that Taumata Arawai is to the Ministry for the Environment what Waka Kotahi, uh, NZTA, is to the Ministry of Transport? You don't set the rules, but you make sure they're followed. Is, is that a sort of a rough idea of, of, of how, how it works? I'll tackle this one. Um, yes, it is. Although our monitoring agency, because we're part of Three Waters, is not actually the Ministry for the Environment, um, our monitoring agency, if you like, our our parent government department, if you want to put it that way, is actually the Department of Internal Affairs. So, um, it, and, and it's interesting that in terms of policy, who sets the rules or, or, or sets the standards that affect us? In drinking water, that's actually the Ministry of Health. And in wastewater and in stormwater, it's the Ministry of the Environment. So a little more complicated, but, but you've basically got it right. Yeah, in general, that, that follows it. Interesting one. Um, we're a multi-generational house. Uh, we are two dwellings under one roof. Um, we Are we considered a single domestic dwelling? I guess it's like a granny flat or or whatever. Uh, that's How does that work? I think if you're under one roof, you're fine. Yeah, it does seem to make, uh, it make sense. Um, uh, my water is supplied by a council scheme. It's piped down to a small tank on my neighbour's property to relieve pressure, then it continues to my tanks. The water's origins are the council scheme, but does my small tank now and my neighbours uh, mean that he's a water supplier to me? So if I understand it, all, all that tank is is just a, a, a tank that holds water uh, and then there's nothing else that's done with that water before it goes through to um, the dwelling further down the network. It sounds like it's just part of the network to me, so um, the neighbour wouldn't be able to supply. And that's, yeah, and the origins there is a council supplied scheme, so I guess that's the council's respons responsibility in that. Um, the, we're a small water supplier and we like to keep going without having to face chlorination in our small supply. Uh, will we be forced to chlorinate under the new rules? 
Do you want me to answer that? Um, it's your yours, Jim. Yeah, it's yeah, all yours. Sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, it's a good question. It's a good question, and and uh, it's an important question. Um, I think I think the thing to remember here is that the legislation requires chlorination only where there's a reticulation system. That's the first thing. So if you don't have a reticulation, there's not a requirement. The second thing that's important here is that uh, a water supplier can apply for an exemption and they can apply for an exemption to um, the need for chlorine or, or residual disinfectant um, or they can can apply for an exemption to any part of those requirements so for example if they can't meet some of the rules to do with that um, there's another mechanism which is what's called a class exemption and that is um, uh, that is um, where uh, um, a class of water supply, so let's say a dock huts uh, can't, um, uh, can't, that's a general exemption, but dock huts can get an exemption from all of the requirements uh, if dock applies for it, uh, well, they can apply for that exemption. The other, the other part of this is we're, we're considering exactly how these requirements in the legislation affect uh, small water supplies. And we're, we're thinking very hard about um, uh, which supplies should be required to have chlorine and which shouldn't. And I think I think the key point here is that um, what's useful to us is submissions on this particular question. And, and if you have a view about it, I think what's really useful is that you let us know um, uh, how you feel about that and whether it's practical or reasonable or um, doable for your water supply. Um, yeah. Can we just know, chlorine's, chlorine's not exactly a particularly friendly um, chemical. And it's not easy to handle. So um, I don't think, you know, we want to see it go into very small supplies lightly. Um, anybody who's ever operated a swimming pool has probably made more than one watt chlorine in their, their lives. And, um, and there are some repercussions. So uh, again, we're looking to develop our acceptable solutions. And, and this is just the first set that we're consulting on now. And then we pick up your feedback feedback from elsewhere around the country as to what other acceptable solutions might be good, might work, um, to allow us not to require chlorine of really small um, supplies. Okay, thanks, Bill. Um, that actually leads us on to another question. Um, how and where can we get a simple test for water quality? Is that going to be established? Are there going to be ways of doing that, testing, testing the water? Uh, yeah, there is uh, standard ways of testing the water. Um, testing the water and, and there's some tests that can be done by the water supplier um, and the rules allow that. So tests, for example, for pH or turbidity, um, they're relatively straightforward tests, but tests for things like microorganisms uh, need to be done in a laboratory. Um, and and you know, that's a, the E. coli test, the cheap test, it's about $30. There's a bit of additional cost in transport, but but for those kind of tests, a water supplier um, simply uh, uh, gets a sample bottle from a lab, collects the sample and sends it back to the lab and they do the analysis. Okay, thanks for that. Um, it does lead on to another query about some um, costs and penalties. Can you elaborate on the penalties imposed if a supplier is found not to meet requirements? I mean, have you established a, a, a list of charges, fees and penalties? There's, um, there's the penalty that set out, uh, have been set out in the Water Services Act. And, um, you know, I'm, I, you could go and have a look at those. Some of those are quite, quite significant. Um, but, um, but I think that's, that's probably the wrong, wrong place for us to start. You know, we've got to, we've got to set the rules to how to play the game first. Um, and we're, we're still in the process of figuring out exactly um, how that game's played because, like I say, there's, if there's 75,000 suppliers we've never, we've never met before and we don't really understand the needs, then we've got to figure out, you know, what compliance looks like. So, um, yeah, so, so there are. And anyone can look up the Act and have a look at those. But, um, but no, that's, that's the end of a, of a very, very long conversation. So we're only at the beginning. So, yeah, I know it's too soon to be talking about penalties. Okay. Uh, we, can, I just, can I just add to that? Um, they're taken most of our... Um, enforcement regime is taken as a combination of the Health and Safety Act with a few other twists turn in, uh, uh, thrown in. So it's pretty similar. A and I think you've got to really consider risk. Um, and, and that's why a lot of our focus at the moment is on those registered water supplies, um, those territorial authorities and government departments, mostly territorial authorities that deliver you know, water to basically 87% of New Zealanders. 
is a, is a hell of a difference if Havelock North manages to basically poison 8,300 people and kill four um, compared with, with somebody who has a, has a small whoops and a very small scheme that might be dealing with a couple of households. And, and I think we've also made a statement pretty early on um, that we're not interested in enforcement unless you're um, reckless or negligent um, for the first couple of years. This is going to take a long while to bed in. We're still learning. And we're still talking. You, you're still talking. We're not. <laughs> but you guys are listening. Um, there's a question here, and I think you've covered already, but we have a pack house on our property with a smoko road a smoko room that's fed from a bore on our orchard that feeds our house and the smoko room in the pack house. Does that make us a supplier? Yes, it does. So once you start providing um, that workplace um, with, with that water for other people to drink um, outside your household, you become a supplier. Okay. That's, and, yep. and can I just add that, that that's interesting for us. Um, and none of these things are set in concrete yet because one of the things we're looking at is um, any farmer who's operating that kind of system is already, again, under the health and safety legislation. And I'd suggest that supplying safe drinking water is actually a requirement of the health and safety legislation in terms of that pack house, that sharing shed, whatever it might be. And so we're looking to work as closely as we can with MPI, um, particularly when they're looking at farm plans uh, and, and just thinking as to whether or not we can find a slot in a farm plan that recognises that a farm might well have a number of buildings, anything from you know the farm manager's place to the to the pack house to um, an Airbnb or an artist patch or the mother-in-law. Um, you've got all of those, and so are they all? If they're all covered by one water supply, um, is there a simpler way of doing it? Still working on that. Great, thanks, Bill. And I think yeah, you have to agree. We have to look after our mother-in-laws. Um, can you can you deregister if you're already registered? If you want to opt out, I guess is the question. Uh, is that an option? Yeah, it's provided in the legislation. Um, and and I think that that's one of the, uh, certainly amongst the 1,200 small um, suppliers that are registered um, that we've kind of inherited from the Ministry of Health. There are a few people who, who are contemplating why they were ever registered in the first place. Um, but a hell of a lot of them are staying with us so far. So... Um, of the, the people that aren't registered, you've got four years to check out your options, work out what to do, see what we come up with. Um, so it's no no issue really for you yet, other than doing what you're doing right now, which is sitting in a webinar and learning what we're up to and what we're doing. But after three months operation, it's pretty soon to be asking us, you know, finer details. Yeah, because there's, there's another finer detail here is um, if I pull the plug and don't supply my neighbours, who's going to supply them? Um, I guess that's all has to be worked through. That, that was quite a... That, that, that's, uh, can I answer that? Because um, that's, one of the, that's one of the pieces of our legislation that's causing a little bit of um, heartache. And I, I'm, has, I don't know if Tim King's left yet, but um, uh, because uh, it is now written into the legislation. It, it was written into the Local Government Act that said that uh, the territorial authority, the district council, um, Tasman district in your case, uh, is is basically uh, to ensure that its communities have adequate water supplies, and uh, and that often meant that that they could encourage somebody whose water supply really did turn to to muck, if you follow me, um, to find another one, or um, they didn't necessarily, shall we say, take them over or adopt them. Um, however, the new legislation says that the district council is the supplier of last resort. And so if a supplier decides that they can't deliver because they can't just can't deliver safe water, um, quite possible, we're already hearing some and seeing some information on arsenic levels that are kind of interesting down in Otago. Um, but if you've got like that and other people with manganese and iron problems, um, if you can't do that and you wish to basically you recognise that you're not delivering safe water to people and, and you, you recognise that you owe them that, then you can seek to meet with us and meet with the district council and meet with your consumers uh, and surrender your water supply. And so I imagine in a very, very few cases in the 1200, that might be possible, might be likely. I, I think very few cases. And I guess um, over the 74,000, then, then let's see what applies in, in four years' time. Very good, thank you. Um, I, I, I am still here, Bill. Oh, Tim, thanks. 
and, and I think you can probably think through the logistics and the challenges that that will either present to local authorities or ultimately potentially for new water entities as they grapple with how to supply potentially a lot of little schemes who find it too hard. I agree, um, which so is the, why the, I think we've got to be reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, keep up, keep that dialogue, I guess. Um, as a rural supplier, that the free water we provide to rentals will necessitate the need to increase rents. And yet we've been told that these water regulation changes will help deliver cheaper water. Um, it's an interesting question. Yeah, the water might be cheaper, but people are going to have to put up their rents to, to cover it. Is, is, that a, uh, you know, is that a fair comment? I'm, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I just don't know the individual circumstances, but the cheaper water really is um, actually, um, I, I think it's a mis misnomer. I, I think New Zealand's going to have to spend significantly in investing in water infrastructure. Um, I, I think there's huge, uh, should we say, catch-ups in terms of infrastructure investment to deliver. You know, there's places have been on boil water notices for an excess of 20 years, a couple even 30, um, and, and they're just going to have to invest and do it. That's going to put the price up. Um, I guess the one thing I'd say to small suppliers is keep your options open and take a good look at what the pricing looks like if you consign your consumers uh, and yourselves into one of those entities. Um, I'd just simply say that I'd, I'd, I'm, I'm glad you've got four years and I've got four years to work through what the options are and take a look. Because while um, the sort of, if those water entities do come through, the scale of things may well bring about savings um, in the long term. Um, for most of the rural small supplies, I, I, doubt, I doubt that that's going to be cheaper by any stretch of the imagination. Most of the prices I know for people with small water supplies are a damn sight less than anybody's paying in, in, in the towns on their rates bill. Thanks, Bill. Um, what consideration has been given to the timing and the effect of the new regulations for councils, given supplies councils manage will soon be managed by a much larger water management entity with different funding and context? Um, yeah, really good point. Um, someone's onto it. Even our legislation when it was written and all the timelines were written into it, um, uh, it they, um, they basically, they didn't contemplate that water services entities were, were going to be a given. Um, and so I, I would think that the last minute changes to our legislation, which gave small suppliers four years, were a kind of a nod to the fact that there was going to be possibly major changes in who was delivering water services. Um, and I'm going to be very interested in how the timelines we've got over the next couple of years uh, to particularly tackle wastewater and stormwater how those get looked at and possibly altered um, when the water services entities, if they are proposed, when we know they're coming in. So I, I think that's a that's a fair point. I'm I'm very grateful that we got that extension for the unregistered suppliers from one year to four years. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if by the time we get to know the 75,000 better, and um, we might find some pretty good reasons to leave some of them alone for even longer. Yep. Okay. Fair call. Um, I think some of these are getting down to absolute um, splitting hairs, but I mean, will you be mandating testing for nitrates and phosphate contamination? Does that come under the umbrella? Um, the jump? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, uh, it's really important to know what the quality of your source water is, and you know, uh, you know, nitrates, nitrates are, are quite a problematic uh, um, contaminant. And uh, it's, it's really important that people know whether it's in their source water or not. So, so what we're doing, um, what we're doing for the first time, and this has not been uh, required before, is requiring water suppliers to test for a range of, of contaminants in their source water. Nitrate's one of them. Um, <clears throat> exactly, exactly how that uh, pans out for the very small supplies, again, is something we're giving some consideration to. And, and, and again, it would be useful to hear from people about that. Okay, thanks for that. Um, there's one here quite technically, uh, technical question, but um, our water comes from a bore and supplies four dwellings and five motel units. We have a central system that has three water tanks, filters and UV systems. Is this going to be okay? Um, if so, what testing, uh, what tests of water and how often will we be required to in the future? This water is already tested by Hills Laboratory for us. Um, can we continue on the same way? 
Um, I don't know the full details, but from what I see there, uh, I suspect you're okay. I suspect that um, there's probably not going to be anything further that you need to do, and you're already testing the water. I would suggest you go and look at the, uh, you, you have a look at the proposed rules and, and uh, see which category you fit into and, and see uh, if there is anything further that you need to do. But, but I can tell you that um, the very small supplies rules are based on uh, cartridge filters and UV and the um, small supply rules, 50 to uh, 500 are based on cartridge filters, UV and um, chlorine. And I think that uh, the, um, if you're already going to Hills Laboratory, you're probably doing a, a suite of tests that they've recommended and, and that would be, uh, I suspect, satisfactory and meet our requirements. Appreciate that. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm just, we've coming to the bottom of, of questions, there's still a few coming in. Um, if there's a drought, uh, I've heard that the priority uh, is to the water source, second to humans, then third and last to stock. Um, that's going to be tough on farming. Um, that's, yeah, an interesting one. I don't actually get that in context. Um, does that make sense to any of you guys? Yeah, I think what they're referring to there is that if you look cold hard at the, um, uh, um, at the uh, Tamanote oh. Wai principles and apply those, you, you might say to yourself that, you know, when drought hit, um, you, you might say that the water that comes first, i.e. that a minimum flows hit, and then nobody can take any more water, in which case your water supplier and, and you have, have got to have worked out what your alternative is, because um, I bet, bet you that has happened before. Um, and so, yep, you have to think about that. And then, I mean, any farmer who deals with drought, um, uh, I guess, uh, has got that the tough calls to make around keeping stock and the priority of stock. Um, having been through long-term droughts in Huronu in North Canterbury and in, in, in when I was with ECAN, it's tough business and it's a tough business as to who gets water. Um, and that's one of my reasons, I guess, why um, to my, my advice to rural suppliers is, is stay independent um, and, and keep abreast of what's going on and just remember you've got four years to work out what works for you. Yeah, good stuff. Um, uh, there's one here. Our dairy inspection already passes uh, the water via MPI. So why should we pay you to pass it again or we'll pay for it to have it passed again? Um, I guess that's the inspection fees. Yeah, that's a good question. And, and I know that Ray and his team are looking uh, closely as to how to work with Assure Quality and, and other agents of, of MPI and to see whether um, the dairy, dairy um, companies, et cetera, and we can connect and um, we, we don't want anybody duplicating. And besides which, wouldn't it be awful if they came up with a different result? <laughs> yes, that, that could be awkward. Um, I'm just scrolling through some. There's a few questions of council here, which are um, uh, not really pertinent to you guys. Um... <sighs> we, if, there's, if there's any that we can answer, Darren, just ask him. You're happy to answer it, Tim? Um, Here's what the question is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's one for you. Will Tasman District Council be rolling out mains reticulation across all of Motueka? Oh, it's true. That's a great question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry, you asked for it. <laughs> and, well, yeah, I should have, should have stayed off this. Um, the reticulation in Motueka has been a discussion for 20 or 30 years. It is, I think, the largest... Uh, town in New Zealand with a large proportion which is currently unreticulated uh, and that the challenge has always been the funding and financing um, given that the vast majority of those people who are currently uh, not reticulated have ac uh, access to their own pores. So as this legislation doesn't currently, as been outlined by Tamara Arawai, affect individual supplies, it's unlikely that that would be the trigger. However, um, down the track with both Taumata Arawai and potentially Three Waters, uh, I don't think I could ever say never in terms of future recirculation. But the barrier has always been the cost, and I don't think that's going to change in a hurry. No, 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 no fair call, I, sorry. I, I'm aware of Machuaka. Um, I think Darfield and Canterbury beats it. Um, and, uh, and I guess for me, is um, I'm staggered when I come into this job to learn the things that I didn't know about people's water supplies. I saw one question asked, you know, are you serious that people have had drink boil water notices for 20 years? I am. I think the record in New Zealand is 30 years um, consistent boil water notice. Um, uh, and I just leave that with you. And the other thing that I've discovered is that um, Mungafai, um, huge 
uh, build up of over 5,000 houses uh, on the coast of Northland um, is basically unreticulated water and um, septic tanks. And uh, that, that is just incredible. That's phenomenal. Um, we're getting into um, technical details again, but um, given the testing requirements, how often should we be testing our bore water? Uh, that's, this is one bore that supplies two households. Um, Jim, yeah. yeah, yeah. Look, the rules at the moment say once a year for any uh, chemical determinants uh, or, or contaminants. And offhand, I can't remember what the uh, what the micro testing is, but I think it's twice a year. I think twice a year it's an E. coli test, something like that. Um, so it's it's not a huge amount. And and you know the E. coli test is a cheap test, and the, the chemical tests I think they're a couple of hundred dollars. Okay, thanks for that. We're actually getting down to the bottom of the list here. So, um, chaps, just a, a, a very, well, this is very small, um, would a small collection tank of 20 litres at the source being a spring on one property that then feeds water to two properties, two home tanks, the property spring is on and the neighbour, is that still class as helping ourselves from the source? You are a supplier in that from what you guys have been saying, isn't it? Um, I, I can't, can't follow that in my head um i kind of need to see no. it but yeah it's um, and, um you'd suggest this 20 liter tank is uh, is a pretty darn tiny tank isn't it to uh, yeah I, 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 I like my view is from from that explanation that doesn't matter how big the tank is if there's a tank on one and then it reticulates to two that's a supply the size of the tank is immaterial yes yes yeah all uh, right yeah, uh, whose tank is it? I guess. Um, so, so, yeah, <laughs> yep. there's, there's right, a lot to enough. work through, right? So it would be, um, yeah, hard one. Um, but you know, you, you, a lot of these things are quite. Um, you know, there was a handshake made in the 1960s. Um, you know, and 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 it's been done like that. You know, for the last um, last 60 years. So well, there's a lot for us to work through. And as I said before, you know. Um, you've never been regulated before so us understanding what that looks like what that means um you know we've got the tools where where it makes sense to say that that actually isn't a drinking water supply to be able to do that um but also where it makes sense to say where well, you might not think it is but that is and these are some of the the quirks and the tools that no one's ever had before um but for us to look at that on the facts of it and make a determination and that's that's something that um you know bill uh, along with a whole bunch of other little tricks he has up his sleeve if he needs to. So, um, yeah, I don't want to venture in a, an opinion that, uh, you know, on that because it's just who knows how that got there. Yes, yes, <laughs> indeed. All right, one, one last question, I think um, it's quite pertinent. Uh, when a scheme has five members but no leader, um, as in no particular person in charge, um, who becomes a supplier? Yeah, we're... we're um... We're very aware, and, and it stems from the answer that Ray gave. Um, so many things were set up almost on grandfather's handshake. Um, and, and, you know, the, um, I, I talked to one guy in Hawke's Bay who, who's, whose grandfather started supplying six people down the road. Um, now the subdivision is 36 houses, and um, he's no longer comfortable with, with holding the liability. And, and I think that what you're going to see is the four years used to, to allow people to sort out um, who takes responsibility for that? Now, what's interesting there is that the 36 have already got together and decided that they'll form a group, take the liability and the hassle off the farmer. So long as the farmer's got the access to the water that he wants to run his farm, um, he'll be quite comfortable with that, I think. And, and that's, to my mind, is one of the unintended kind of consequences of us bringing the registration in and, and the verification in of safe drinking water is that we have caused a lot of old style agreements and old style handshakes and old style understandings be brought into the light. And uh, we'll be working with Federated Farmers actually, uh, just to find out a whole lot of simple mechanisms by which um, kind of the right structure can be found. Um, it's got nothing to do with us as regulators, but we just recognize it's something we wanna work on just to make it easy for people. We don't want people seeing water supplies cut off. That's, that, that's not the aim of this. I appreciate that. Okay, there's just, just one very last one. Um, are we classes? One roof, we build a granny flat two metres from our house for my elderly parents. Both roofs collect and feed into the same water tanks that in turn feed into the filtered drinking water supply in both homes. Is there, Am I a supplier? Is the question. Probably not. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Look, chaps, thank you very much for your time tonight. We really yeah. appreciate it. Can I just ask, uh, can I just ask one question, um, yeah. Darren, before you finish? Just in terms of the conversation, because a lot of this is, there's so many examples, as you mentioned, and, and no one's really aware of quite how many or where they all are. Exactly what's the process to determine? So you, we've talked about self-registration. Mm. So people effectively coming to you and saying, we are one and um, here we are. I, I suspect there will be some people who may choose not to follow that path. How do you, how do you anticipate over time that it's going to, um, who, who is going to, and how is it likely to work that you try and identify where all these uh, situations exist? Um, I'll have a go at answer, Matt. Let's just state for the rest of this year and possibly the first half of next year, we don't really want to hear from anybody who desperately wants to register. We've got enough problems dealing with uh, 67 units of local government who are questioning what they're doing and where they're going. The three waters and the possible four water entities that may be um, landed on top of us. Um, and we were also dealing with those 1,200 smalls that were previously led, uh, registered. And they're a huge workload and they're quite special. And in particular amongst that 1,200 are 150 um, marae or papakaianga who are a very special, unique um, category that we need to work with. And so the message to unregistered is relax and, and just basically read all you can, uh, work out what suits and what works for you. Uh, and we'll come back to you over the course of the next couple of years and keep talking it through, keep finding out about you. Um, I can imagine that, you know, even when we finish registering anybody, everybody, in theory, in about 10 years, there'll still be the likes of Shrek coming down out of the hills to say, I never realised I was a water supply. Um, th this is a, a long, slow burn. And, and the, the bottom line on us at the moment is to make it sensible and make it practical. And, and remember that goal is that you think about the people you're supplying water to and you take the responsibility of supplying safe water to them seriously. Appreciate your time, chaps. Thank you very much, uh, Bill Bayfield, Jim Graham, Ray McMillan, and uh, Mayor Tim. Thanks for your, your input tonight. We really appreciate it. Now, I just want to wrap up and say this has been recorded. Uh, the video of this will be available on our website for people to check back on. Um, I also will make a transcript of all the questions and answers uh, that people have put forward, and we will publish them on the website. But uh, until the next time around, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for people for attending. We had uh, 140 people there at the, at the beginning of our session tonight, which was a great turnout. Really appreciate it. So uh, from Tasman District Council and Taumata Arawai, thank you and good night. See you later. Yeah,